And the service is introduced by the Reverend George Pitcher. It begins now as the school's chamber choir sings the plain song Vexilla Regis. The royal banners go forward. Good morning. I'm standing at the brow of the hill that King Harold tried to defend in the Battle of Hastings, which took place in the fields below me exactly 950 years ago this week. It was one of the most momentous and influential events in our nation's history. We know, of course, that it was a bloody battle, and we know William won the day and that Harold was killed. We think that the high altar of the now ruined Abbey Church near here is the exact spot where Harold died. But of this we're certain. The battle changed the course of England's story and that of the British people. And it remains the last time that our island was successfully invaded by a hostile enemy. The culture and technology of the Normans, they came with archers and cavalry against Harold's already battle-wearied infantry, brought profound change which resonates to this day. This year, we've also been commemorating the centenary of the Battle of the Somme, a battle that had a deep impact in almost every town and village of Britain. Alas, today we're still witnessing the carnage of war in Syria, South Sudan, and elsewhere. So we come together this morning with young people from Battle Abbey School and members of the local community joining our congregation to reaffirm that there is another way the road down which our God of peace and reconciliation leads us. God of peace, in Christ you call us out of the darkness of conflict and war and into the light of your kingdom. Help us to trust that in that place of perfect understanding and limitless love, death and hatred and pain will be no more. We offer this prayer in the name of the Prince of Peace, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn affirms that promise. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come.
courage, cries the voice of Harold. Hold but till nightfall, and ye are saved. Courage and freedom. Harold and Holy Cross is the answer. Forward, cries William, as he gallops towards the breach. On rush the Norman knights. But Harold is already in the breach, rallying around him hearts eager to replace the shattered breastworks. Close shields, hold fast, shouts his kingly voice. Look up, look up, and guard thy head, cries the fatal voice of Haco to the king. At that cry, the king raises his flashing eyes. Why halts his stride? Why drops the axe from his hand? As he raised his head, down came the hissing death shaft. It smote the lifted face. It crushed into the dauntless eyeball. Fight on, gasped the king. Conceal my death, holy cross. England to the rescue. Woe, woe. Words of the Victorian biographer of Harold, Edward Buller Lytton. The Battle of Hastings was squalid and horrific. Some 2,000 Normans and 4,000 Englishmen died that day. The English dead left on the hillside by the triumphant Duke William of Normandy to rot as a warning to the population right across the English countryside of what resistance would mean. Yet our Christian church, then as now, sought to play its role in reconciliation and the making of a new peace. The sun had set, the first star was in heaven, the fighting man was laid low and on that spot where now, all forlorn and shattered, amid stagnant water, stands the altar stone of Battle Abbey, rose the glittering dragon that surmounted the consecrated banner of the Norman victor. Close by his banner, amidst the piles of the dead, William the Conqueror pitched his pavilion and sate at meat. And as he sate and talked and laughed, there entered the tent two humble monks, their lowly mien, their dejected faces, their homely surge, in mournful contrast to the joy and splendour of the victory feast. They came to the conqueror and knelt. Rise up, sons of the church, said William mildly, for sons of the church are we. Deem not that we shall invade the rights of the religion which we have come to avenge. Nay, on this spot we have already sworn to build an abbey that shall be the proudest in the land. From Psalm 35. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise up to help me. 
draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. O Lord, who is like you? You deliver the weak from those too strong for them, the weak and needy from those who despoil them. The Battle of Hastings is a staple of English childhood, perhaps the most readily recognisable date in school history, 1066 and all that. The Bayeux Tapestry, created just a few years after the battle, records the legend, how Harold was slain with a Norman arrow to the eye. But it's neither a tapestry nor French. It's embroidery and it's Anglo-Saxon art. A symbol, perhaps, of the early integration of Norman culture. 950 years on, Joshua and Hermione reflect on what makes us the people we are today. 1066, the most recognised date in English history, and it all happened in the fields right outside my school. Imagine the noise, arrows flying like poisonous darts high in the air, pikes, woods on wood, wood on metal, cries for victory and cries for anguish, absolute frenzy, the stench and silence of death. No boy of my age and living at times of these events could have imagined the transformation that would result. I don't think people realise how terrifying it was to find out that there was an army coming to invade the country and that men were being sent away on foot to fight and never knew if they were going to come home or not. Imagine you're a soldier's child and you're hoping and praying to God to let him come home again. You also hope that no enemy turns up in your village.
That was the Song of England, composed by Louise Denny with words by Randall Mannering and sung by the Battle Abbey School Choir, directed by John Langridge and accompanied by Julius Weeks. In a few moments, we'll hear from our preacher today, the Bishop of Chichester, the Right Reverend Dr. Martin Warner. But first, we hear words from the second chapter of the Book of Isaiah, read by the headmaster of Battle Abbey School, David Clark. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What have the Normans ever done for us? It's a question that the Monty Python team famously almost asked in the satirical film The Life of Brian. But it's a serious question today as we review the impact of the Norman conquest following the Battle of Hastings 950 years ago. For us in Sussex, there's a lot at stake here because this was home to Harold, son of Godwin, who is charmingly depicted in the Bayer Tapestry, riding to Bosham near Chichester and going to church there. That church still stands at the heart of a lively community on the edge of Chichester Harbour. Whenever I visit it, absorbing the centuries of prayer and worship that seep out of its ancient stones, the question, what have the Normans ever done for us, begins to find an answer. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that the years after 1066 were not about the euphoria of winning the Battle of Hastings. They were about the much longer, costlier and lasting achievement of building peace, establishing justice, providing education, nurturing the arts and creating a safe and industrious society. And the Christian Church played a significant part in that achievement. Vast areas of England were reorganised into ecclesiastical districts or dioceses. In Sussex, the diocese moved its centre to Chichester, where the bishop is still based. In other cities, the cathedral was rebuilt and retains today much of the form that the Normans gave it, most spectacularly in Durham. Some of these centres were monastic, but all of them were served by a community in which education was integral to their way of life. They were the schools of art in sculpture, calligraphy and the painted word, in architecture and engineering, song and sacred music. Reading back into time, it would be wrong to view the 11th century through the best achievements of the high medieval age. The Battle of Hastings was just one of the birth pangs of that amazingly creative era. And like any birth, it involved pain and struggle. The value that we place today on what the Normans did for us ought not to mask the struggle to assimilate them into an existing culture. The legends of Robin Hood, who steals from the rich and gives to the poor, are also part of the resistance folklore of Saxon nobles who felt dispossessed by powerful immigrant Normans. These legends begin to ask moral questions about the quality of life in a society that is experiencing change and the growth of cultural diversity. They are questions that had surfaced many centuries earlier in the writing of the prophet Isaiah. Here we find an image that draws a sharp distinction between the destructive nature of the human desire for power and the domestic context of the home. The Lord, the God of Jacob, is a God of hospitality. 
Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. On the mountain of the Lord's house, the nations of the earth find space to be at home. Here is a forum, but not a law court or a bureaucracy, in which to learn how to live together. And their response to being there is that the nations of the earth refashion the weapons of war into the instruments of husbanding the earth, plowshares and pruning hooks, that will sustain life, not destroy it. As we survey Europe 950 years after the birth pangs of its high medieval renaissance, the lessons on how to be at home with each other are urgent priorities for our international agenda. It is clear that we have put massive economic resources into how to destroy each other and have done so to the detriment of the well-being of the earth itself, let alone her people. More specifically, and in recent weeks more harrowingly in our news bulletins, we have seen in Syria a truly shocking disregard for the sanctity of the home and the vulnerability of children, the women who care for them, and the sick and suffering who cannot care for themselves. In marked contrast to the vision of Isaiah, weapons have been turned upon the home, the symbolic and sacred place where we learn to live together. We have devastated, not cultivated the earth ignoring the warnings it gives us of our threat to the sustainability of life for future generations. Today in Europe, I believe that the Christian Church has an indispensable contribution to make in learning how we live together. Our Church of England schools, educating over a million pupils, are part of this, as is the army of 80,000 church-going Anglican volunteers, who enrich the lives of young people and their families, irrespective of faith or any other human condition and status. And there is more. As Christians, we also believe that every person of faith and religious conviction, Christian or otherwise, has a particular contribution to make towards the culture of being at home with each other. In the sweep of world politics, it is evident that we are now in a post-secular era that has to take into account the power of faith. As Christians who proclaim that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life, we also find within our inherited scriptures words of peace and hope that shape a vision for all nations on the earth. Looking back to the Battle of Hastings in the dawn of the last millennium, we see that what the Normans did then, we have to do together today. We have to win the peace, not a battle. So let us nurture justice, education, the arts, a safe and industrious society, one that is tolerant, pluralist and free. And may the lessons of history inspire and sustain us in this work to the glory of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our prayers this morning were recorded by pupils of the school outside on the windy battlefield. So let us pray. God of peace, in the stillness and tranquility of this place, we recall in our hearts and minds the day so long ago when it was filled with violence and brutality. We hold up to you all those who died here, nameless to us but known to you. As we survey this historical battleground, may we resolve to be vigilant in the keeping of your peace. We offer thanks for the peace of this place, and we pray for those who know no peace this day, for the lives ravaged by war in Syria, the lives and homes destroyed, and for all those families and those without family who flee the conflict there. In this historic place of battle, we pray that you shed and spread abroad your spirit, that all peoples may be gathered together under the one banner of the Prince of Peace, as children of one God. We pray for our leaders in their work for peace. Grant them courage to draw no sword but the sword of righteousness, to fight only for your justice and to know no strength but the strength of love. May they know what it means to beat saws into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. And Lord, teach each of us the same as we stand in this place that has known the horrors of war. So let's gather all our prayers together now, and especially holding in our hearts and minds those who have been suffering so terribly in Hurricane Matthew. In the prayer that Jesus himself taught his disciples, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
What has shaped us in the past prepares us for our future. Whether we triumph or we fail, we know that we are loved beyond measure and forgiven of God in the living Christ. And now we offer thanks in our final hymn for that love that never changes. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided. peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love and pray for, this day and forevermore.
Sunday worship came live from Battle Abbey School on the site of the Battle of Hastings. The choir was directed by John Langridge. The organist was Julius Weeks and the violinist was Jada Marsh. The producer was Andrew Iris. In next week's Sunday worship, Reverend Roy Jenkins visits Abba Van 50 years after the disaster which killed 116 children. <laughs>